Now, today I am going to go into the, the very fundamental guts of Hinduism. But what I want to do is to begin with certain documents that are known as the Upanishads. And these documents constitute what is called Vedanta, V-E-D-A-N-T-A, and that is compounded of two words, Veda, Anta. Anta means end or completion or summation. Veda, of course, is related to the Latin video, to see. Veda is the fundamental revelation of the Hindu way of life contained in its earliest scriptural documents, which are generally dated in the period between 15 and 1200 BC. The Upanishads, as being the summation of the Veda, are uh, from, found from over a long period of time, beginning perhaps as early as 800 BC. Some of the Upanishads are much, much later than that. The basic position of the Upanishads is that the self is the one and only reality without a second. That all this universe is finally Brahman and appears to be a multiplicity of different things and different events only by reason of Maya, which is illusion, magic, art, creative power. So then, it is basic to the Vedanta that Brahman, this intangible, non-objective ground of everything that exists, is identical with the ground of you. And this is put in the formula Tattvam Asi. T-A-T, Tat. Same as our word that. Tvam, T-V-A-M. Same as the Latin uh, Tuus, Thou, Asi, Art. We should translate that into a modern American idiom as You're It. This, of course, is a doctrine which is very difficult for those brought up in the Judeo-Christian traditions to accept because it is fundamental to Christian and Jewish theology that whatever you are, you are surely not the Lord God. And Christians feel about the Hindu doctrine that we are all fundamentally masks of God that it's pantheism, and that's a dirty word in Christian theological circles. Because of the feeling that if everything is God, then all moral standards are blown to hell. Because it means everything is as good as everything else. Everything that happens is really God, and this must include the good things and the bad things. And that seems to them a very dangerous idea. Actually, all religious doctrines contain very, very dangerous ideas. However, we won't worry about that for the moment because what the Hindu means by God when he says Brahman is not at all the same thing as a Jew means by the Lord Adonai because the Jew and the Christian means the boss to whom divine honors are due as above all others. The Hindu, on the other hand, does not mean the boss. He doesn't mean the king, the lord, the political ruler of the universe. He means the inmost enemy, which, as it were, dances this whole universe, without, as it were, the idea of authority, of governing some intractable element that resists his or its power. So, if uh, a Christian 
or a person in a Christian culture announces that he has discovered that he is God, we put him in the loony bin because it's unfashionable to burn people for heresy anymore. But in India, if you announce that you're the Lord God, they say, well, of course, how nice that you found out. Because everybody is. So then, why uh, the great problem arises? Does it appear that we are not? Why do we think? Why do we have the sensory impression that this whole universe consists of a vast multiplicity of different things? And we don't see it all as one. Well, what would you think it would be like to see it all as one? I know a lot of people who study Oriental philosophy hear about attaining these great states of consciousness, nirvana, moksha, which the Hindus use, liberation, satori, Zen Buddhist word for enlightenment or awakening. Uh, what would it be like to have that? What, how would you feel? if you saw everything is really one basic reality. Well, a lot of people think that it would be as if all the outlines and differentiations in the field of vision suddenly became vague, melted, and we saw only a kind of luminous sea of light. But rather advisedly, the Vedanta philosophy does not really seriously use the word one of the Supreme Self. Because the word and the idea one has an opposite, many, on one side, and another opposite, none, on the other. And it is fundamental to Vedanta that the Supreme Self is neither one nor many, but as they say, non-dual. And they express that in this word, Advaita. A is a negative word like non. Dvaita is from Dva, same as the Latin duo, two. So Advaita is non-dual. And this, at first, for Westerners, is a difficult conception. Because you naturally, as a Western logician would say, but the non-dual is the opposite of the dual. Therefore, it has an opposite. True. But the Hindu is using this term in a special sense. It's like this. On a flat surface, I have only two dimensions. So that everything drawn in two dimensions has only two dimensions. How therefore, on a two-dimensional level, can I draw anything but two dimensions? How in logic, in human rationality, can I possibly think except in terms of opposites? All rational discourse is talk about classification. The classification of experiences, of sensations, of of notions. And the nature of a class is that it's a box. And if a box has an inside, it has to have an outside. Is you is or is you ain't is fundamental to all classification. And we can't get out of it. It's almost as if, you see, whatever we see to be different is an explicit difference on the surface covering an implicit unity. Only, it's very difficult to talk about what it is that unifies black and white. Of course, in a way, the eyes do. Sound and silence are unified by the ears. So, you, you can see, can't you, that if you can't have one without the other, it's like the poles of a magnet, North Pole and South Pole, you can't have a one-pole magnet. True, the poles are quite different. One's north and the other's south. But it's all one magnet. And some such idea as that is what the Hindu is moving into. 
when he's speaking of the real basis or ground of the universe as being non-dual. Take it uh, to fundamental opposition that I suppose all of us feel between self and other, I and thou, I and him. There is something that is me, there's an area of my experience that I call myself, and there's an other area of my experience which I call not myself. But you will immediately see that neither one could be realized without the other. You wouldn't know what you meant by self unless you experienced something other than self. You wouldn't know what you meant by other unless you understood self. They go together. They arise at the same time. You don't have first self and then other, or first other and then self. They come together. And that shows, you see, the sneaky conspiracy underneath the two. Like the magnet between the two different poles. And so more or less that, sort of uh, what isn't classifiable, but which lies between all classes class of elephants opposite the class of non-elephants uh, has, as it were, the walls of the box joining the two together. Just as your skin is an osmotic membrane that joins you to the external world by virtue of all the tubes in it and the nerve ends and the way in which uh, the external energies flow through your skin into your inside and vice versa. But we do, don't we, see and feel and sense, or we think we do, the world as divided into a great multiplicity. A lot of people would think of the universe as a collection of different things, a kind of cosmic flotsam and jetsam washed together in this particular area of space. And prefer to take a pluralistic attitude and don't see anything underlying. In fact, in uh, contemporary logical philosophy, the notion of any basic ground or continuum in which all events occur would be considered meaningless, for obvious reasons. If I say that every body in this universe, every star, every planet, is moving in a certain direction at a uniform speed, that will be saying nothing at all unless I can point out some other object with respect to which they are so moving. But since I said the universe, that includes all objects whatsoever. Therefore, I cannot make a meaningful statement about the uniform behavior of everything that is going on. True. But on the other hand, every sound you hear on the radio whether it be a honking horn, a Bach sonata, or a newscast, is the vibration of the diaphragm in your loudspeaker. The radio doesn't tell us this. The announcer doesn't come on first thing in the morning and say, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from now until closing time, all the sounds you will hear will be vibrations of the diaphragm in your speaker. That is taken for granted and, and ignored. So, in the same way, your eardrum is basic to all that you hear. Your lens of the eye and retina is basic to all that you see. What is the color of the lens of the eye? We say it is no color, it is transparent. In the same way as a mirror has no color of its own. But the mirror is very definitely there, colorless as it may be. The eardrum, unheard as it may be, is very definitely basic to all hearing. The eye, transparent as it may be, is very definitely basic to all seeing. So therefore, if there were some continuum in which everything that is going on and everything that we experience occurs, we would not notice it. We would not be able, really, to say very much about it, except perhaps that it was there. It wouldn't make any difference to anyone, except the one all-important difference 
that if it wasn't there, there wouldn't be any differences. But you see, philosophers nowadays don't like to think about things like that. It stretches their heads, and they would rather preoccupy themselves with more pedestrian matters. But still, you can't help it. If you're a human being, you wonder about things like that. What is it in which everything is happening? What is the ground? Well, you say, obviously it's not a what, because a thing that is a what is a, is a uh, classifiable thing. And so, very often, the Hindu and the Buddhist will refer to the ultimate reality as no thing. Not nothing, but no special thing. Unclassifiable. Can't put your finger on it, but it's you. It's what you basically are. What everything basically is. Just as uh, the sound of an automobile horn on the radio is in one way an automobile horn, but basically it is the vibration of the diaphragm. Okay, so you are all, in the Hindu view, vibrations of the entire cosmic diaphragm. Put it like that. That's analogy. And I'm using saguna language, or cataphatic language, from the point of Christianity. The best language is to say nothing, but to experience it. How can you experience it? Well, that's the whole thing, as I pointed out last time. The nub of all these oriental philosophies is not an idea, not a theory, not even a way of behaving, but it's basically a way of experiencing, a transformation of everyday consciousness so that it becomes quite apparent to us that that's the way things are. But you, when, you, when it happens to you, it's very difficult to explain it. So in exactly the same way, when somebody has uh, that sort of breakthrough which transforms his consciousness, and it happens all over the world, it's not just a Hindu phenomenon. When somebody suddenly realizes it's all one, or technically non-dual, and really uh, all, all, all this coming and going and all this frantic uh, living and dying, grabbing, struggling, fighting, suffering, all this is a fantastic phantasmagoria. He sees that. But when he tries to explain it, he finds his mouth isn't big enough. <laughs> because he can't get the words out of their dualistic pattern to explain something non-dualistic. So why is this so? Why are we under this great, magnificent hallucination? Well, uh, the Hindus explain this in Saguna language as follows. It's a very nice explanation a child can understand. The fact of the matter is that the world is a game of hide and seek. peek -a Now you see it, now you don't. Because, very obvious, if you were the Supreme Self, what would you do? I mean, would you just sit there and be blissfully one and uh, ever and ever and ever? No, obviously not. Uh, you would uh, play games. You would, in other words, for the very nature of the fact that I said, no energy system is an energy system unless it lets go of itself. So you would let go of yourself. And you would get lost. And you get involved in all sorts of adventures. And you would forget who you were. Just as when you play a game, playing poker. And although you're only playing for dimes or for chips, you get absorbed in the game. And you, nothing really important to win, nothing really important to lose, and yet it becomes fantastically interesting who wins and who loses. So in the same way it is said that the Supreme Self gets absorbed through ever so many different channels, which we call all the different beings, in the plot, just like an artist or a writer 
gets completely absorbed in the artistic creation that he's doing, or an actor gets absorbed in the part in the drama. At first, we know it's a drama. We go to a play, and we say it's only a play, and the proscenium arch tells us that what happens behind that arch is not for real, just a show. But the great actor is going to make you forget it's just a show. He's going to have you sitting on the edge of your chair. He's going to have you crying. He's going to have you trembling because he almost persuades you that it's real. And what would happen if the very best actor was confronted by the very best audience? Why, they'd be taken in completely. And the one would confirm the other. So this is the idea of the universe as drama. That the fundamental self, the Saguna, Brahman, plays this game, gets involved in being all of us, and does it so damn well, the, the, it's so superbly acted that the thing appears to be real. And we're not only sitting on the edge of our chair, but we start to get up and throw things. We join in the drama, and it all becomes uh, whatever it is that's going on here, you see? Then, of course, at the end of the drama, because all things have to have an end that have a beginning, the curtain goes down and the actors retire to the green room. And there, the villain and the hero cease to be villain and hero, and they're just they're the actor. And then they come out in front of the curtain and they stand in a row and the audience applauds the villain along with the hero. The villain for having been a good villain. The hero for having been a great hero. The play is over. And everybody heaves a sigh of relief. Well, that was a great show, wasn't it? So the same idea, the green room is the Nirguna Brahman. That behind the whole show where there are no differentiations of I and thou, subject and object, good and evil, light and darkness, light and death. But within the sphere of the Saguna Brahman, all these differentiations appear because that's out in front, that's on the stage. And no good actor, when on the stage, performs his own personality. That's what's wrong with movie stars. They try to cast a person to act a role which corresponds to his alleged personality. But a great actor can assume any kind of personality, male or female, can suddenly convert himself right in front of the audience into somebody who takes you in entirely. But in the green room, he's his usual self. So Hinduism has the idea then, you see, it's all the conventions of drama go right along with it. That all this world is a big act. Leela, the play of the Supreme Self. It's therefore compared to a dream, to a passing illusion, and uh, you should not therefore take it seriously. You may take it sincerely, perhaps, as an actor may be sincere in his acting, but not serious, because that means it throws you for a loop. Although that, of course, is involved, we do take it seriously. But you see, one of the great questions that you have to ask yourself, when you really get down to the nitty-gritty about your own inmost core, is, are you serious? Or do you know deep within you that you're a pudding? In the last session of this particular course, which is an introduction to Oriental philosophy, I tried to condense the fundamental principles of what you can call the central viewpoint of Hinduism, Vedanta, the, not so much the doctrine as the experiential realization that what you are 
basically is the same as the root and ground of the universe. In other words, in the formula Atman, the self, is Brahman, the ground of being. Now today, I want to relate this way of playing hide and seek with the very design of Hindu society. Because Hinduism is um, difficult to characterize as a religion, especially because we belong to a religion where in its institutionalized form it can very well degenerate into a religion that's for Sundays only. That doesn't apply to every detail of life. In other words, when a Hindu brushes his teeth, it's a religious act. There is not such a thing as a Christian way of brushing your teeth. But in Hindu life, all the details of life are Hinduism. So then, underneath all the presuppositions of Hinduism can be found a transition from one kind of culture to another, from a hunting culture to an agrarian culture. And this explains a great deal about this way of life. Now, in a hunting culture, which is a culture on the move, nomadic, Every man knows the whole culture. In other words, you do not get a high specialization, division of labor. A man who is a hunter has to know how to make clothes, how to skin animals, how to cook them, how to shoot them, how to trail them. He has to know every kind of skill because he's often alone. And in a hunting culture, you do not get a special division of priesthood from ordinary people. Every man in his own way is capable of being a priest, but some more so than others, not by virtue of any ordination or schooling that they've received, but by their receptivity, because the priest or holy man of a hunting culture is called a shaman. A shaman is an individual who separates himself from society for a certain period and goes alone into forests or mountains to commune with what he will usually call the ancestors. That is to say, with his basic origins. And he will find something by way of a spiritual experience for himself, not through any teacher, not through any previous authority. He finds it genuinely on his own. And the shaman therefore goes into solitude to find out who he really is. Because in society everybody is busy telling you who you are and you rely on others to see yourself. But to find himself, in other words, to find out what all this really is all about, the spiritually minded man of the hunting culture goes alone. And so the culture of the American Indians is to a very large extent hunting culture and you will find the spiritual man of the American Indians is a shaman. However, when a hunting culture becomes settled, it becomes agrarian. There arises farming, looking after the land. And then you get a completely different kind of society. Let me suggest that it's something like this. Where do agrarian communities settle? Where do they build a village? Usually at a crossroads especially if roads be crossed with water, a river. And where the crossing meets, the agrarian village settles itself and protects itself by building a pale.
we say a person is beyond the pale. That means he's an outcast. He lives outside the village. He's a pariah. But in the village, notice that the pale having been built around the crossroads, it divides the village into four sections. And oddly enough, there are four divisions of labor in all fundamental agrarian societies. And these consist of one, the priest. You know the word clever, clerk, cleric, and clear are all the same word. It meant someone who's literate, clever, also clear. Put it down clearly. You can't do that unless you're literate. And so if you're a literate person, you're a cleric. And clergy is the same word as clever in Old English. Much conceit of clergy is an Old English phrase meaning he's intellectually snobbish. <laughs> so that's your caste number one. Caste number two, warrior. Or incidentally, ruler. Three, merchant or craftsman. And four, laborer. unskilled. So now, what are these? There are four castes or four roles. And in society where there's a division of labor because an agricultural society is more complex than a hunting culture, we immediately get division of labor and we all play different roles. That is to say, assume different masks for purposes of living in this kind of community. All of you, you see, are essentially, be, are essentially clerics. You are a, what the Hindus would call Brahmin, because you're all being trained in the university. So the, the, the Hindu name for this class is Brahmana, for this class Kshatriya, for this class Vaishya, and for this class Shudra. So those are the basis of the four castes. And so if you are in the pale, if you belong to the community, you have to be typified. They say, is you is or is you ain't? Into which of these do you fit? And you must fit into one of these. Now caste is something, of course, which has got a very bad name from a modern point of view, both modern point of view with us and with the modern India. Because they say, once you get into a caste, you're stuck. If you are born to a laborer, a laborer you must be. If you are born to a warrior, you must be a warrior or a ruler. You could never become a cleric. And we think that's pretty terrible. Because in our culture, we work under the assumption that you as an individual are free to choose whatever occupation you will follow. Uh, but unfortunately, this involves going to school. And for certain purposes, going to school is one of the worst things you can do. For example, if you want to become a completely fantastic expert carpenter, you have to begin the trade at the age of seven at the latest. And your father, if he is a carpenter, is obviously the best teacher you can have. In a very ancient form of agrarian culture, as in India or as in Japan or China, a young man who was son of a carpenter would become fascinated with his father's occupation. And that would mean a very special relationship would grow up between him and his father, which does not grow up in our country. Because most of us do not know what our fathers are doing. They go away to a mysterious office or factory where they do something called making money. As, an incident, as a, the main reason for the incidental uh, occupation which they pursue there, uh, but the, the children and the wife 
have no active part in that occupation whatsoever. They know Papa only as a kind of clown who returns home in the evening having made money and one dad's money is the same as another dad's money. It makes no difference except that everybody wants more. They don't give a damn how he gets it so long as he doesn't complain too much. So the child instead of learning and participating in his close father relationship, in learning an occupation or a trade or an art, is sent off to an impersonalized institution to be taught to be everything and nothing. And therefore doesn't learn early enough any craft so as to become a true master of it. What is happening, for example, in Japan, where a father can no longer apprentice his son at seven years old to become a carpenter because he has to send him away to school to learn to be an insurance salesman. Uh, he uh, can't teach his child and then comes high school. And then when the kid gets out of high school, he's interested in girls. And it takes him until he's about 22 to be able to settle down to learn carpentry. It's too late too late to attain real mastery because a great Japanese carpenter never uses a plan. He doesn't need a drawing. He does it all by eye and can fit the most complicated joinery together by eye. And it's the same with the arts of weaving textiles, of making superb ceramics, jewelry, any kind of gorgeous craftsmanship depends on beginning as a child. And so, all right, we can't buy it anymore in this country. There is not, on any kind of commercial basis, great craftsmanship available here. We have to go abroad to get it, to so-called primitive societies. We must be content with plastic simulation. So there is something to be said, you see, for the caste system. I just wanted to present the other side of it. Now, however, in going through this system, there are certain stages, whatever caste you're in. There are three stages of life which are called ashrams. Ashram uh, means really an abode. Uh, a center for spiritual study, for practicing yoga, will be called an ashram. But an ashram also means uh, an abode in the sense of a stage of life. And the three stages are one called brahmacharya. That means the stage of being a student. Two, grihastha, household. And the third stage, vanaprastha. That means forest dweller. Isn't that funny? Grihasta, householder. Vanaprastha, forest dweller. Because you see, in this order of society, you come into society and you go through one of its acts as a grihasta or householder. But when you arrive at the point in life where you have got a son by birth from yourself or by the marriage of your oldest daughter, a son who will take over your work, you give up being a householder and you become a forest dweller. In other words, you go outside the pale and back to the forest. With the idea of finding out who you really are, while you were in the community, you were playing a role, one of the four roles or its subdivisions. And you came on as Tinker Tailor, Soldier Sailor, Rich Man, Poor Man, Bigger Man, Thief. But that wasn't the real you, that was one of the masks of the Brahman, the true self behind everything. To find out the Brahman, who you really are, in order to get ready to die, you become Vanaprastha. Go back to the jungle having fulfilled your work with the world. Now, in practice in India, this means that the head of the house often moves to a cottage in the backyard. You know, in the course of time, everything becomes sort of going through the motions. 
The original idea was that he became, what do they call it in Sanskrit? Shamana. It's almost the word shaman. A shaman is a person who has gone back to live in the forest. And therefore he is in regard to society an upper outcast. There are also lower outcasts. Those are the aborigines. The people living in India before the Aryan invasion. Who later became the untouchables. They are not even Shudra. They are outside caste altogether. Like the Indians in the United States. They are true untouchables in our caste system. And their plight is so much worse than the Negroes, it's unbelievable. But they are outcasts. So if the same thing happened in India. But the upper outcast is a man who goes wild. And in Hindu society, you have the right to do that. You are respected if you voluntarily abandon caste. And of course, in doing so, you give up your name. And you take another name. Now, taking a new name is taking a new identity. An Indian in society may be Mr. Mukhopadhyaya. And that would be a family name indicating membership in a family. When he becomes a Shramana, however, he will take a name such as Brahmananda, Bliss of God. He takes a divine name. And the original idea of a Christian name when you were baptized is that you gave up the name Julius as you might be a Roman and took on instead the name Matthew one of the apostles one of the divine uh, beings of the Christian religion or you might take the name of an angel Michael or in Spain or Mexico even Jesus 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 Maria would be a perfectly reasonable name for a man in Spanish culture but you take on a divine name to indicate a transformation of your, your identity. But in this case, when you give up caste, you see, and return to the forest, you become a nobody. And therefore you take one of the names of that which is no one, namely the Brahman, the Supreme Self. Because it's no one in the sense that it's all ones. And therefore in itself no one. So you abandon caste and you abandon name, you give up property, you give up uh, both the responsibility and society uh, is uh, allowed to give up responsibility for you. If they give you arms, if they support you, that's for gravy. They don't have to do it and you don't figure that they owe it to you. But this, this kind of society has a profound respect for people who leave it. And they feel that a society cannot be healthy unless it somehow pays respect to people outside the pale. To non-joiners and outsiders who have indeed fulfilled some responsibility within society and then abandoned. They would, I think, be a little uptight about hippies who would abandon society before having fulfilled a responsibility in it. But in a sense, every Shramana is a sort of elderly hippie. Now, of course, uh, our hippies have a, a, a different problem in that they are critical of the very structure of the society in which they are asked to enter because they feel uh, that it is um, a rat race a game which has lost its quality they might even prefer a caste-like society of this kind uh, in that it might have a bit more quality because you see uh, in our society one works not as a vocation 
In this scheme of things, every vocation that you perform is called Svadharma. And this word, the word Dharma has many meanings. Dharma? It means uh, function in one sense. It means the thing that is right for you. Here, Sva is the same as the Latin Suus. And so it is one's own, your own function, what we would call your vocation in life, Svadharma. As we say, doing your own thing, that's Svadharma. And so you have to find, as it were, your own thing. Now, uh, a job which you do purely for money can never be called a Svadharma. Because you're doing it for another end, to make money, which has a purely symbolic value. But when you do a certain work, because that is what is your thing to do, you want to be a doctor, because you're fascinated with medicine and all its problems. And you just, you like people so much that you want to heal them from their diseases. Or for the same reason, you might want to be a nurse. Or well, you might be fascinated with problems of law and so become a lawyer. Or fascinated with religion and so become a minister. Then you've got a vocation. Because you would do that thing whether it paid you very much or whether it didn't. Because that's the one thing you have to do. If you're a painter, you have to paint. If you're a writer, you're one of those crazy people who just has to write. I'm a writer. I have to write. Whether it makes me money or whether it doesn't, I would still have to be a writer. So that's a Svadharma. And every person's vocation in caste is supposed to be your thing, your Svadharma. But uh, we feel in our culture, you see, that we have such a tremendous choice of Svadharma that sometimes it's what the French call embarras de richesse. It's like uh, embarrassment of riches when you're confronted with one of those enormous menus in a restaurant which has so many things on it you can't make up your mind which to pick. Well now then, you see as a person passes out of this, he gives up the social order and becomes a nobody. He then in that sense he goes back to the forest. He goes back from the organization the role-playing of the agrarian culture to the solitude of the hunting culture to find out who he is alone all by himself. And so he becomes in that sense the upper outcast. The man who is respected by those people who are still in caste because they say, without this kind of person, we should lose our sanity. We should become confused with our roles. Unless there's always the hermit in the forest to remind us that man is not his role, that he's something deeper than that. And that the true end of man is to play the game of hide and seek for a while and to get lost in these roles. But then to return back to nature, back to the way of the forest, and in later life, as distinct from infancy, with all that experience behind him, find out again who you really are, so that when death comes, what a funny thing will happen. Death comes and will find no one to kill. For while you are identified with your role, with your name, with your ego, there's someone to kill. But when you're identified with the whole universe, death finds you already annihilated and there's no one to kill.
problem is we speak first of all of the unity of life and then suddenly define the social orders as one, two, three, four and the stages of life as one, two, three. Of course. Because the whole thing about the one is that it pretends to be many. See, that's, that's the gimmick. The game of hide and seek is dismemberment, falling apart, losing control, losing unity. Let's disintegrate. And then after you've been dismembered, let's remember and come back to oneself and know who it really was all the time. So the one implies the many and many imply one. And so it goes in and out. It's a systole and diastole, an in-breathing and out-breathing that goes on and on. Now you see it, now you don't. Can the whole know itself as one? Yes. You suddenly get to the extraordinary state where you see that all the variety in front of you you know, all, I look out in this room and it's a great variety. It's a wonderful patchwork of all sorts of different people and colors and things. But you get to the point where you see that that variety means one. Things, uh, the, the more different everything is, the more it proclaims its basic unity with everything else. It just shouts it. In other words, when I see a bright patch of orange next to a bright patch of blue, uh, the brighter that orange, the more it manifests the unity underlying everything. Now that sounds paradoxical, but that's the way I feel it. If all of you wore khaki, olive drab or something, I would feel uniformity rather than unity. I would say, well, that's a drag. Everybody trying to look the same. That's fake unity. It would feel like a, a plastic champagne glass. Horrible. You know, it warms the champagne instead of that cold crystal. See? And say, that's fake unity. Away with it. But when everybody comes on himself, you know, in a natural way, then I see true unity in through the variety. See, in this society, we are exposed to so much information. Radio, television, newspapers, magazines, books tell us all sorts of attractions about things that other people are doing and we're always wishing we were in somebody else's shoes. Because we know so much and we're informed so much. But in this kind of culture, everybody is settled for the fact that one day is just like another. And that they do what has to be done, what is in the course of things. And we don't approve of this because we say it's lacking in friskiness, adventure, and get up and go. But on the other hand, they turn around to us and say, you are completely unstable. You are so frisky, you are so nervous. You can't stay still for two seconds. You can't stick to a job. You can't do a a anything stable. You're utterly unreliable and you will probably blow up the planet. And uh, it's legitimate for the simple reason that technology is getting rid of the need to earn a living. And many of us will soon have to be paid not to work. At which point we can become Vanaprastha right away. <laughs> so uh, as technology develops that means the leisure society and uh, we are going to have to find ways of living in which one's self-respect does not depend upon one's productivity.
In Europe, we have the same caste system. In the feudal system, lords spiritual, lords temporal, commons, and serfs. The only way to find that out is to persist in the state of delusion as hard as possible. Now, by becoming anyone from any of the lower castes can become a priest or a cleric. And the minute you became a priest, cleric, monk, or whatever, you were at an angle to all the other castes. You could mix with the others. Resolutely and consistently. Yes. What you're doing already. What about this problem of the separation of ages in this kind of culture? Well, now it is a little easier for them because the rate of social change is not what it is with us. In a settled agrarian culture, the essential way of living remains the same for centuries. And only violent change occurs when technology is introduced and then everything is blown wide open. But in an Indian village today, they are doing all the essential processes of life exactly the same way they were done a thousand years ago. And for this reason, the tension between the generations is very small. The son and the daughter expect and know no other alternative than doing what father and mother have done. And of course this brings them close together especially where the son or the daughter is constantly all day long associated with the work of father and mother. Now you know that little children today, little boys under the school age, little girls under the school age, always are interested in what their parents are doing and want to join in, but are not allowed to do so because they can't go to the office with their father and the mother is always in a hurry because instead of having spent most of the day preparing dinner in the kitchen, she's been out to the coffee clutch, the League of Women Voters, or some such dissipation, and uh, it comes back, and then she's in a hurry, and she doesn't want some little girl buzzing around, uh, having to teach her how to boil an egg, or how to bake a cookie. Uh, unless she's patient, unless she gives time for that kind of thing. But little girl is very, very eager indeed to find out how to do what mama does. But she mustn't because she might make a mess. That's the great discovery. So instead of that, little girl is given a toy, a toy cooking stove and a toy baby to look after. The child is annoyed that the cooking stove doesn't really work that the toy baby doesn't wee-wee properly, even though they've tried to make it that way. And the little boy is even more annoyed that the toy gun doesn't kill anything. <laughs> so uh, every day by about five o'clock in the afternoon, just before the father of the family returns, the entire house is littered with broken plastic and smashed toys that have been torn apart in fury. So there develops a knockdown, drag out battle between the mother and the children to throw all that stuff into a bottom of a closet mixed up with sucked lollipops and half chewed bubble gum before daddy comes home. And because she wants the house to look like a nice home for him. So this awful trauma occurs in which the children are addled and have to be gassed with television. And the mother is in no fit mood to be the loving cook of a superb dinner. So she gets some frozen up stuff that can be thrown together in a hurry, fixes Papa a couple of martinis that he won't know what he's eating anyway. <laughs> I don't know if I answered the question, I may have got sidetracked. <laughs> I think we've got to realize that uh, children are benefited by being exposed to a considerable number of adults. And that in default of the old family relation,
households where, in other words, a mother and father have a grandmother and a grandfather living with them, several aunts, uncles and cousins, and it's a big household based on blood relationship. Uh, it's very difficult to do that today because the speed of social change makes it difficult for one generation to live with the tastes of another. But what we are going to do is all couples of the same generation will join together and they will have separate dwelling quarters round a central service area where they have common washing machines, common kitchen, common recreational facilities. And any set of children can be exchanged with any set of parents. So that if your children get sick of you, they can go to live with somebody else's parents. And I remember as a child that uh, some of the most educative periods of my life were when I went to live with other families. And we often, you see, as kids, we invited other kids to come and stay with us and share our family life. I suppose that goes on here just the same, but still, those are very productive periods when you find out how another family lives. So, and all this, this solves the babysitting problem. It solves the problem of having to own too many cars, too many dishwashers, uh, and all that sort of thing. Your, your, your dishwasher or your laundry machine is idle most of the day. Why isn't somebody using it? Yet. 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 I have been emphasizing all along that the central core of the kinds of oriental philosophy that we're talking about is not theory but experience. And the trouble here is that so long as one attempts to communicate this philosophy in words, we remain in the area of theory and do not necessarily transfer over into experience. It is then for this reason that in addition to the scriptures or uh, verbal teachings of Hinduism, there is a discipline whose object is to enable an individual to realize what the words are about. I would use so strong a word for realization as sensation because the realization of the tattvam asi the Upanishadic proposition that you're it uh, comes over you if you do have the experience not so much as um, you feel convinced that the earth goes round the sun even though you don't actually see this happening it's not so much like that as it is like an immediate sensation of the thing which the proposition Tattvamasi is trying to say. And so this entering into the experience, which is the heart of Hinduism, is the function of a discipline called yoga. The word yoga, Y-O-G-A, Don't say, as many people do, yogi. Yogi is one who practices yoga. And a yogini is a female practitioner of yoga. But yoga is the same word as yoke. Latin yungari, to join. And English, union. The yoke between two oxen may be regarded equally as a discipline and as a joining of the two oxen. So the basic meaning of yoga is something like union. The realization, in other words, of the union of what we call the separate individual with the ultimate ground of being, Brahman. 
We don't know how early yoga is in India, but there are statues found in Mohenjo-daro in the Indus Valley dating from at least 2000 BC of figurines in the posture familiarly associated with yoga, the Padmasana or the full lotus posture in which uh, all, almost all Buddhas are seen to be sitting with the legs crossed and these feet up on the thighs, soles upwards. It apparently then is something quite ancient and uh, was in some way absorbed and assimilated to the Aryan civilization which invaded India from the north somewhere between 15 and 1200 BC. Yoga was apparently, like everything else in those days, handed down as an oral tradition and was not committed to any kind of written record until there appeared a book called the Yoga Sutra. Sutra really means thread, uh, but I suppose through the idea of threaded leaves, ancient manuscripts in India were written on palm leaves, came to mean scripture or book, sacred book. And the Yoga Sutra is associated with a gentleman named Patanjali, P-A-T-A-N-J-A-L-I, and is of uncertain date. It may be as early as 200 BC, it may be a bit later. But this is the standard text on the practice of yoga. There are Chinese forms of yoga, which probably originated independently at the same time, out of the Taoist way of life, and they subsequently had considerable influence on India, as did the Indian ways on the Chinese. Now, it's important to study the Yoga Sutra from its opening, or oh, second to opening phrase, the second verse. His first verse says, now yoga is explained. And the commentators attach particular importance to the word now, because the assumption is that something else has gone before. In other words, you are expected to be a reasonably sensible, rational and mature human being before you engage on this particular path. In the same way as I pointed out to you in the last session, that the Hindus have the view that a man should fulfill the duties of the householder before he engages upon the spiritual life. And so in the same way there are certain preparations before you start out on yoga. And those preparations usually involve having mastered whatever the disciplines of your culture may be, the essential disciplines of your culture, so that you know how to handle them. So that if you get into the higher states of consciousness, which yoga brings about, you won't run amok, uh, because not being able to distinguish between good and bad from the social point of view. The next verse says, in Sanskrit, I'll write it down, because it's, um, This means yoga is chitta is a very difficult word to translate into English because in Sanskrit there are about five words for mind. There are one. Well, we have mind, we have consciousness. Awareness, thought, they're all very vaguely defined. Chitta is a more precise one. And I would say awareness. Vritti uh, comes from a root which means to turn. 
turn around. And so we get the idea of um, turbulence, vicious circling, whirlpooling, uh, wavering. Uh, anyway, going round and round and round. So yoga is awareness, turbulence, stopping. There it is, all in one sentence. You can take this sort of analogy, which is used by yoga teachers. Take it that awareness is something like a pool of water. When the water is quite still, you can see in it the reflection of the sky and everything in the bottom of the pool. When it's muddy and turbulent, you can't. So in the same way, your awareness of the world is like reflecting pool. And if it's turbulent, you don't see clearly. You're not clearly aware. You don't have a mind like a mirror. You have a mind like a distorting mirror, which keeps wiggling. So yoga then is the art of stilling the mind. There are various schools of thought about what a still mind is. According to one school of thought, the goal of yoga is samadhi. Well, everybody agrees that samadhi is what it's all about. What is this word, samadhi? It refers to a state of consciousness which is sound. Don't say sound, that's different. <laughs> sound, related to our word, sound. From the Latin, summa, eventually Sanskrit, sound. Complete, total. Also related to the word same. Looking on everything equal. Having an equal mind towards all events. Samaras in Sanskrit. Equanimity. Calmness. Uh, having, as it were, the same attitude in victory and defeat. Also same in the sense of the knower and the known are the same. There is no further division between myself on the one hand and what I am aware of on the other. It's all one. Samadhi. In yoga, there are differentiated, differentiated two kinds of samadhi. One is called vikalpa, and the other is called nirvikalpa. The word vikalpa means an idea or conception. So there could be a samadhi with an idea in it of some kind, a concept. Nirvikalpa would mean without a concept. Or samadhi produced by way of a gimmick, technique, and the ideal samadhi, look mama, no hands, no gift. But some schools, as I was saying, there are different opinions about what this all means. Interpret nirvikalpa samadhi as being a state in which there are is such a degree of absorption or of trance that there is no awareness left of the physical world. You are completely, well, if a psychiatrist looked at you, he would say you were catatonic. Sitting in that posture, immobile, absorbed, wrapped. And this is held by one school of thought to be the highest attainment of the human mind. I don't agree with this point of view. I follow another school of thought which has a different idea of nirvikalpa samadhi. And this, in my view and that of others, it is not the total sensation of sensory input, but simply the, sens the cessation of conceptions, of thoughts about 
what you are experiencing. And therefore that the meaning of Chitta Vritti Niroda is not as the other school interprets it, getting a perfectly blank mind. But it means two things in my interpretation. One, a mind that is not going in vicious circles. And two, the mind free from the hypnotic influence exercised by thoughts, ideas, words. So then let's consider first of all, what is a mind in the grip of vicious circles? Well, one of the most obvious instances that we all know is the phenomenon of worry. The doctor tells you that you have to have an operation. And that has been set up so that automatically everybody worries about it. But since worrying takes away your appetite and your sleep, it's not good for you. So the doctor tells you not to worry because he wants you on the operating table in a state of good health, well rested, etc. But you can't stop worrying and therefore you get additionally worried that you are worrying and therefore will not be in the right shape to be on the operating table. And then furthermore, because that is quite absurd and you are mad at yourself because you do it, you are worried because you worry because you worry. That is a vicious circle. Another form of vicious circle is when a person is convinced that they ought to be unselfish and are so convinced for selfish reasons. I would like to think of myself as an unselfish person because that's the sort of person I'm supposed to be. So therefore I have a selfish reason for wanting to be unselfish and because of that no amount of effort will ever succeed in making me unselfish but will only succeed in sending me around in circles. I'll be proud that I'm humble, etc. That is Chitta Vritti, turnings of the mind, see? So now, yoga is initially stopping that. Can you allow your mind to be quiet? Isn't it difficult? Because the mind seems to be like a monkey, jumping up and down and jabbering all the time. Once you've learned to think, you can't stop. And an enormous number of people devote their lives to keeping their minds busy and feel extremely uncomfortable with silence. When you're alone, say in a doctor's waiting room, which may be very uninteresting, nobody's saying anything, there's nothing to do, there's this, this worry, this uh, lack of distraction, I'm left alone with myself. And I want to get away from myself. I'm always wanting to get away from myself. That's why I go to the movies. That's why I read mystery stories. That's why I go after to girls or anything that you do or get drunk or whatever. I don't want to be with myself. I feel queer. I feel like, uh, you know how it is when you run your fingernails up a blackboard on a cold day? Creepy. So, well, why do you want to run away from yourself? What's so bad about it? Why do you want to forget this? Why do you want to become absorbed? Because you are addicted to thoughts. And this is a drug, a real dangerous one. Compulsive thinking going on and on and on and on and on all the time. It's a habit. As you keep telling yourself where you are, who you are, what's going on, how good it is, how bad it is. Reading the newspaper of your mind. You know a lot of people, they get hold of a newspaper the newspaper reads them, they don't read it. The newspaper is designed to read you. The typographers, the layout people, very carefully calculated how to carry your eye from one end of it to another. 
So there's a difficulty about stopping that activity. And you really have to stop it if you want to be sane. Because if I talk all the time, I don't hear what anyone else has to say. And then I'll end up in the situation of having nothing to talk about but my own talking. Or so in exactly the same way, if I think all the time, I won't have anything to think about except thoughts. And that's the academic fallacy. See, when you add books to the library, a great many of the books that are added to the library are books about books. They're not necessarily books about life. Some of them are. But most of the books, especially PhD dissertations, are books about books about books about books. And that doesn't really get us very far. So in order to have something to think about, there are times when you simply must stop thinking. You can learn later on in yoga how to be in the state of samadhi and think at the same time. But first of all, you have to learn how to stop thinking. Well, how do you do that? The first rule is don't try to. Because if you do, you will be like someone trying to make rough water smooth with a flat iron. And all that will do will stir it up. So in the same way as a muddy, turbulent pool quiets itself when left alone, you have to know how to leave your mind alone. It will quiet itself. There are certain things, however, which help. And the yogis tend to use two techniques for assisting their minds to become calm. One is breathing. That is called pranayama. Prana means breath or the vital force of the body. Pranayama, the discipline of breath. And the other is called mantra. It's, all, it's connected with prana. It's connected with breathing, but it's uh, chanting, chanting sounds. And both of these have a slightly auto-hypnotic effect which helps one to quiet thoughts. Um, these days, many hippies go around wearing beads. Anybody got beads on? What do you wear beads for? Do you know why you wear them? Do you know what beads are for? Beads are for yoga. This is a Tibetan rosary which has been blessed by the Dalai Lama. And uh, they um, wear them on the hand, rather. Well, they carry them around the neck, but they usually use them in the hand. And they will do for timing. You've got your yoga practice for the day, and so many rounds of the beads will time you. And either you use the beads for breathing, in, out on one bead, in, out on the next bead, in, out on the next bead, and so. Now they have uh, essentially, the breathing in yoga is not forced. You don't do kind of breathing exercises in a forced way. You have, first of all, to find out how your lungs want to breathe. Let them do that and count your breath with your fingers rather than using numbers. Try and keep away from concepts and numbers are concepts. That's why you use your fingers on the beads instead. And for every in-breath and out-breath you use one bead. Just experiencing breathing and experiencing the sensation of the beads passing your fingers. Don't think about it. Don't try not to think about it. But uh, the, the bead and the breathing will distract you from thinking. And you will find that in due course, the breath will automatically become slower and slower and slower with great ease until it seems that you're hardly breathing at all, it's so slow. 
Now for some people, that is not so easy to concentrate on. So it makes it easier to concentrate if you add to the breathing a mantra. And uh, so the mantra means the chanting of certain syllables which although they do have a meaning and they are maybe the names of the divinity they very soon cease to have a meaning as you use them. So uh, the Tibetans use such a mantra as Om Mani Padme Aham Or Hindus use sometimes just with beads Ram 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 or uh, more complicated ones Om Ram Shri Ram Jai Jai Ram Om Ram Shri Ram Jai Jai Ram Om Ram Shri Ram Jai Jai Ram or oh, such things or uh, many many varieties of these mantras and if you keep doing that, you find you're getting into another state of consciousness. You're not thinking in the ordinary way. As the words, let's take any English word, take the word yes. We know, we think we know, yeah, yes means, it means yes, you know, I will. But say it several times, yes, 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 yes. And strike you, we use that funny noise, yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. And after a while it stops meaning anything. It becomes a noise. And that's the way you, through using thought symbols, you free the mind from thought. It's like using a thorn to pick out a thorn that's stuck in the skin. So uh, yoga uses those and breathing to help the mind to become quite still. Now those you see are vikalpa in that they are gimmicks. So through breathing and uh, mantrams and so on you get vikalpa samadhi, samadhi, samadhi with gimmicks. And that means that you have a crutch for your religion it depends on some kind of an extraneous device. But the ideal of yoga is called the natural state, which in Sanskrit is uh, sahaja. To be in the state of realization without having any religious gimmickry. What Spiegelberg of Stanford used to call the religion of no religion. Again, it's with mama no hands. So that you don't need to do anything special or to think any special thought or to say any special prayer or to have any particular ritual on which you depend for getting into the realized state of consciousness but you're in it naturally all the time. That's Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And this means then that you could seem to the outsider as living a perfectly normal life, that you eat when you're hungry and sleep when you're tired and you go about your business and nobody can tell you from just anyone else unless they know you very well. And that's considered in all Hindu and Buddhist thinking very, very fine achievement. It's compared with a bird flying through the sky and leaving no tracks. Or with geese flying over a lake 
And although they are reflected in the lake, they don't disturb the water. They leave no trace. So one might say that the ideal of yoga is to go through religion and get rid of religion. Because religion is a medicine. And it, it should not be a diet. That, you see, is a fundamental difference between physicians and clergymen. A physician tries to get rid of his patients. He gives them medicine in the hope that they will go away and not come back. But unfortunately, the clergyman tries to get you hooked on the medicine so that you'll come to church every Sunday and pay your contribution to pay off the mortgage. That's a very serious problem with churches. The investment in buildings and such liabilities. But the doctor, you see, although they have these hospitals, they hope that the turnover will be big enough <laughs> to uh, pay for it. And they can't get a big turnover unless they are successful in getting rid of patients. But the patients who have been successfully got rid of go and recommend this doctor to other patients. And so they keep coming through because we're always sick people. And the, the Hindu, in a way, and especially the Buddhist, take very much this view of religion. Religion is not something to get hooked up on. A person hung up on religion or hung up on yoga is felt to be still in bondage. So yoga is to get rid of yoga. and come to the final state here called Nirvikalpa Samadhi where you are in the realized state naturally. Now of course the doctrine of the Upanishads is that everybody is in the state of union, of yoga, of union with Brahman whether you know it or whether you don't. And so, trying to have that state naturally is really and truly doing something redundant. You are trying to be where you are, to become what you are. But that's because you don't know you're there. And we can see, if we go back, why you don't know that you're there. Because if you are the Brahman, you in the beginning of things deliberately pretended you weren't. Only you did it so well that by now you've forgotten you did it. And so to wake up again, you have to press on trying to get back, although that's unnecessary. You will only learn that it's unnecessary through trying to get there of making a fool of yourself, trying to get what you already have. So that in a way, I've been told that there are idiots who sit in padded cells trying to catch their thumb. You know, you put your hand round your thumb like this, so here's your thumb wiggling like that, and then you say, oops, let's try and catch it. No, no, it went away. No. <laughs> Now it's gone. Oh, see, you, you can't catch it. Because, of course, it's the thing you're trying to catch is the catcher. So, in the same way, when you set out to realize that you are the ground of being, the Brahman, you're doing just that. You're trying to catch your own thumb. See? And it doesn't work. And you think, Oh dear, this is becoming a very difficult task. I must ask my teacher about it. Uh, I must be sure he's a good teacher, because I've set myself this very, very tough problem. <laughs> but it's a silly problem. Only, in most cases, it takes years of sweating at it to see how silly it is. That's all it amounts to. Basically. 
So what it happens in yoga is that you get a set of hurdles, discipline hurdles to go through. And I'm only giving you a very, very sketchy account of this because I could go into all kinds of technicalities. But you can read those in the books. All about the chakras up the spine and the complicated ways of breathing to awaken the different chakras or levels of consciousness and all that jazz. But all that is jazz, essentially, over certain fundamental principles. What I want to be sure of is that you get the fundamental principles. That, in other words, uh, you have lost your sense of harmonious uh, coherence with the whole domain of being. And you're puzzled as to what's the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do, how I ought to be, uh, how to control my mind, how to do this, that and the other. And everybody has contradictory advice for you. He who hesitates is lost. Look before you leap. Many hands make work light. Too many cooks spoil the broth. Religion, everything, wisdom is full of contradictory advice. So they say to you in the end, ah, but you see, it takes a wise man to know when to do which. Well, they say, you say, how do you become wise? Well, it's a matter of experience. Like you apply for a job and they say, well, how much experience do you have? And you say, I haven't had a job before. Well, you must get one and then we can give you one. To him that hath shall be given. And it's the same way all these people talk. You ask a question and the guru answers. When you know the answer, you won't ask the question. Well, that's pretty obvious. All this frustration, but you see the real meaning is, the question you're asking is a false problem. You're asking, in other words, why do people inquire into religions? Why do they go to teachers? Why do they want spiritual exercises and practices? Because they feel unhappy. Because they feel Well, not really because they feel, because they think. When you feel unhappy, that's one thing. But when you think you feel unhappy, that's much more of a problem. Because you keep repeating over and over and over to yourself, gee, I feel depressed. Oh, I feel just so put down. And you wrap your tongue around that, like, you know, when you've got a filling out of a tooth, your, your tooth keeps wandering into the hollow, I mean your tongue keeps wandering into the hollow left by the filling and you fuss with it. Same piece if you get an itch or something, you keep scratching it. Some people if they get a pain in a certain part of the body, keep moving it so the pain is there. And uh, they wonder if it's still there and they can't help doing that. You see? So in this way, we talk ourselves into problems. And so all this kind of thing starts up. But actually, the, the problem is an attempt to solve an impossible conundrum. That's the most frustrating problem of all. See, all sensible questions have sensible answers. How do you cook swordfish steak? problem. Well, someone can tell you. It's quite simple. How do I draw a square circle? Well, the question doesn't mean anything. So naturally, there's no answer to it. So how can I get myself into a state where I'm always happy? How can we arrange things in this room so that they're all up? Silly question. So was the other one. How can I attain peace of mind? 
There's a Zen story about that, where the master says, bring out your mind and I'll pacify it. And the questioner says, but when I look for, um, for my mind, I can't find it. He said, there, it's pacified. <laughs> So that's the sort of thing that's going on in yoga. You know, you think you're a problem to yourself. And so that guru says, find you. There was this great sage in India, Sri Ramana Maharshi. And people used to kind of, but he lived in modern times. It's not the same as the Maharishi that you know about from recent times. But Ramana. He was a wonderful man with the most beautiful, big, humorous eyes. He always sat half naked with a little loincloth around him. And he'd sit in a kind of patio or a compound and read the newspaper. And sometimes he'd meditate and sometimes he'd sleep. And sometimes he'd answer questions. Throngs of people came from all over the world and sat in this compound just to watch him. And there were chickens around scratching and mothers feeding their babies and dogs and so on. He took very little notice of it all. But they just wanted to sit in his presence. And they would come to him and say, Oh Maharshi, uh, who was I in my past life? And he'd come back and say, Who wants to know? Oh Maharshi, uh, how many years will it take me to attain liberation? He'll say, who wants to attain liberation? Always he'd throw every question back on the source of the question. Who are you? Well, that's something you see you can't get hold of. That's this thing, you see. Who am I? Wow. Who am I? I can't get it. <laughs> So the yoga teacher sets you to doing this as fast as he can get you going, as ruthless, as relentless. Who are you? Find out when you breathe. What is breathing? Find out when you know. What is knowing? Get to the root of the matter. Ask, 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 inquire, inquire, inquire. And one day, you, it all becomes clear. And it's so simple, that is the most difficult thing in the world to explain. It's like, you just see, ah, well this is it, this is the way it is. There is no problem about it. Death, suffering, these aren't problems. They're awful if they are problems. The worst kind of suffering is that which you think there might be a way out of. When you know there isn't, it's easier to bear. So, this sense of it all being perfectly clear and simple and transparent. This experience now that you are having at this moment. is what it's about. This is the beatific vision. This is cosmic consciousness. This is where it's at, baby. You know? And it just becomes clear like that. But you see, when you say that to someone who may not have had such an experience, they say, mm, so what? You mean it's just it's just what's going on now. I would say, why do you use the word just for what's going on now? Because that means you're only half awake, half awake at all. You are bolting your life like some people bolt their food. And you think you've experienced now 
because you say, I have now, after now, after now, after now, after now. I have boop, that one goes down, boop, that one goes down, boop, that one goes down, boop, that one goes down. I still feel hungry. I want the good one. I hope that somewhere down on the end of the line in the future is going to be a sudden now experience which will be, yeah, that's the thing I wanted. <laughs> ha, but tomorrow never comes. When I was a small boy, I used to haunt that section of London around the British Museum. And one day I came across a shop which had a notice over the window which said philosophical instruments. Even as a boy, I knew something about philosophy, but I couldn't imagine what philosophical instruments could be. So I went up to the window and there displayed were chronometers, slide rules, scales, and all kinds of what we would now call scientific instruments because science used to be called natural philosophy because as Aristotle says the beginning of philosophy is wonder philosophy is man's expression of curiosity about everything his attempt to make sense of the world primarily through his intellect that is to say his faculty for thinking and thinking, of course, is a word used in extremely many ways and is a very vague word for most people. But I use the word thinking now and hereafter, you must understand this, in a very precise way. By thinking, as distinct from feeling or emoting or sensing, I mean the manipulation of symbols, whether they be words, whether they be numbers, or whether they be other such signs as, say, triangles, squares, circles, astrological signs, or whatever. These are symbols. Sometimes a symbol is a little bit more concrete and less abstract than that, as when you get a mythological symbol, like a dragon. But all these things are symbols, and the manipulation of symbols to represent events going on in the real world is what I call thinking. So, Philosophy, in the Western sense, means generally an exercise of the intellect and the manipulation of symbols is very largely, until we come to poetry and music, an exercise of the intellect. But what philosophy has become today in the academic world is something extremely restricted. By and large, in the academic world of both the United States and England, Germany, France to some extent, philosophy is falling into two other disciplines. Mathematical logic on the one hand and linguistics on the other. And uh, the departments of philosophy throughout the academic world have bent over backwards to be as scientific as possible. As William Earle, who was professor of philosophy at Northwestern University, said in an essay called Notes on the Death of a Culture, that an academic philosopher today must, above all things, avoid being edifying. He must never stoop to lying awake at nights, considering problems of the nature of the universe and the destiny of man, because these have largely been dismissed as metaphysical or meaningless questions. So, uh, unworthy of a scientific philosopher who arrives at his office at 9 o'clock in the morning dressed in a business suit carrying a briefcase and does philosophy until 5 in the afternoon at which point he goes home to cocktails and dinner and dismisses the whole matter from his head. And William Earl adds, he would wear a white coat to work if he could get away with it. Uh, this is of course a little exaggerated, but this by and large is what a departmental academic philosophy has become and oriental philosophy is simply not philosophy in that sense these things Hinduism Buddhism and so on are sometimes also called religions and I question the application of that word to them because again I like to use the word religion rather strictly I'm not going to be so bold as to venture a definition of religion which is supposed to be true for all time all I can do is to tell you how I use the word religion. And I want to use it in an exact sense from its Latin root, 
uh, which really means a bond or rule of life. And therefore the most correct use of the word religion is when we say of a man or woman that he or she has gone into religion, that is to say has joined a religious or monastic order and is living under a rule of life, living a life of obedience. For religion, if Christianity is a religion, if Judaism is a religion, if Islam is a religion, they are based on the idea of man's obedient response to a divine revelation. And thus, religion as we understand it in these three forms of religion consists really of three things. We will call them the three C's, the creed, the code, and the cult. The creed is the divinely revealed map of the universe, the nature of things, the revelation of the existence of God, of Allah, Yahweh, or as we say God, and his existence, and his will, and his design of the universe, the creed. To this we add the second C, the code, the divinely revealed law or exemplar which man is supposed to follow. In the case of Christianity there's a certain variation in this because the principal revelation of the code aspect of things in Christianity as well as the cult is not so much a law as a person. God is said in Christianity to be supremely revealed in the historic Jesus of Nazareth. And so the code here becomes really the following of Jesus of Nazareth, not so much in obedience to a law as through the power of divine grace. Then finally the cult. This is the divinely revealed method or way of worship so that man relates himself to God by prayers, by rites, and by sacraments, which in these particular religions are not supposed to be so much man's way of worshiping God as God's way of loving himself in which man is involved. So in the Christian religion, say in the Mass, would say that we worship God with God's own worship, following the saying of Meister Eckhart, that great German mystic, the love with which I love God is the same love wherewith God loves me. So too, in the, when monks in a monastery recite the divine office, using the Psalms as the basis of it. The Psalms are supposed to be the songs of the Holy Spirit. And so in using the Psalms, the idea is that you worship God with God's own words, and thereby become a sort of flute through which the divine breath plays. Now, neither Hinduism, Buddhism, nor Taoism can possibly be called religions in this sense. Because all three of them significantly lack the virtue of obedience. They do not conceive the Godhead as related to mankind or to the universe in a monarchical sense. For you see, there are various models of the universe which men have used from time to time. And the model which lies behind the Judeo-Christian tradition, if there really is such a thing, is a political model. It is based on, it is a kind of using the metaphor of the relation of an ancient Near Eastern monarch to his subjects. And he imposes his authority and his will upon his subjects from above by power, whether it be physical power or spiritual power. And so it is thus that in the, say, the Anglican Church, 
when the priest at morning prayer addresses the throne of grace, he says, Almighty and everlasting God, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth, most heartily we beseech thee with thy favor to behold our sovereign majesty Elizabeth the Queen and all the royal family. Now, what are these words? This is the language of court flattery. And the title King of Kings, as a title of God, was borrowed from the Persian emperors. The Cyrus of Persia, the Kyrios, hence Kyrie Eleison. Lord have mercy upon us, is a kind of image drawn from things earthly and applied to things heavenly. God as the monarch. And therefore, between the monarch and the subject, there is a certain essential difference of kind, what we might call an ontological difference, so that God is God, and all those creatures, whether angels or men, or other kinds of existence which God has created, are not God. There is this vast metaphysical gulf lying between the two domains. That gives us, as citizens of the United States, some problems. Because, as a citizen of the United States, you have believed, and do believe, that a republic is the best form of government. How can this be maintained if the government of the universe is a monarchy? For surely, in that case, a monarchy will be the best form of government. And many of the conflicts in our society arise from the fact that although we are running a republic, many of the members of this republic believe, or believe that they ought to believe, that the universe is a monarchy. And therefore, they are above all insistent upon obedience to law and order. If there should be democracy in the kingdom of God, that would seem to them the most subversive idea ever conceived. Now I'm exaggerating the standpoint a little bit, just for effect, because there are some subtle modifications which one can introduce theologically, but I won't go into them at the moment. Now there are at least two other models of the universe which have been highly influential in human history. One is dramatic, where God is not the skillful maker of the world, standing above it as its artificer and king, but where God is the actor of the world, as an actor of a stage play, the actor who is playing all the parts at once. And this is essentially the Hindu model of the universe. Everybody is God in a mask. And of course, as you know, the, our own word, person, is from the Latin, per sona, that through which comes sound. And this word was used for the masks worn by actors in the Greco-Roman theater which being an open-air theater required a projection of the voice, so the actors wore masks with megaphonic mouths. And so the word person has, however, in the course of time, come to mean the real you. There was a very serious mistake made in translation from Greek to Latin when uh, one began to talk about the three persons of the Holy Trinity the three masks of God wasn't quite the right idea because the Greek word was hypostasis, not a word prosopon which would have meant properly translated person. Hypostasis is a very difficult word to translate. You could say that ice, water and steam were three hypostases of the same thing. And that would be a little better analogy, not too good. But in Hindu thought, Every individual, as a person, is a mask, but fundamentally a mask of the Godhead. A mask of a Godhead who, although the actor behind all parts, the player of all games, 
is indefinable for the same reason that you can't bite your own teeth. For the same reason that you can't look straight into your own eyes. You can never get at it because it's the middle of everything. The circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Then a third model of the universe, which is characteristically Chinese, is that the world is an organism. And a world which is an organism has no boss. Even no actor. Because you see, in any organism, there isn't really a boss or top organ. We are accustomed, of course, in our culture, to think of our heads as ruling the rest of the body. But there could well be an argument about this. I'm going to put up a case that the stomach is chief. Because the stomach, uh, the sort of alimentary tract with a digesting process in it, is surely anterior to brains. Uh, there may be some sort of rudimentary nervous system attached to a stomach organization. But it's the, the, the more primitive you get, the more you get a little creature that eats. See? It's a sort of tube. And in go things at one end and out the other. And that because that wears the tube out, the tube finds means of reproducing itself to make more tubes. So that this process of in and out can be kept up. But in the course of evolution, at one end of the tube is developed a ganglion, which eventually develops uh, eyes and ears and has a brain in it. The better to scrounge around for food. And so the stomach point of view is that the brain is the servant of the stomach to help it scrounge around for food. But the other argument is this. True, the brain is a later development than the alimentary tract. But the alimentary tract is to the brain as John the Baptist to Jesus Christ, the forerunner of the big event. And the reason for all this scrounging around and uh, stomach and stuff is eventually to evolve a brain. And man shall eventually live primarily for the concerns of the brain, that is, for art and science and all forms of culture, and the stomach shall be servant. Now, cynical people like dialectical materialists say that's a lot of hogwash. It's really all history is a matter of economics, and that's a matter of the stomach. It's a big argument, and you can't decide it. Because you can't, at this stage, have a stomach without a brain or a brain without a stomach. They go together like a back and a front. So the principle of organism is rather like this. An organism is a system of a differentiated system, but it has no parts. That is to say, the heart is not a part of the body in the sense that a distributor is part of an automobile engine. Because although surgeons are trying to treat the body as a machine with replaceable parts, but the difficulty is that these are not parts in the sense that they are screwed in. In other words, when the fetus uh, arises in the womb, uh, there are not a lot of mechanics in there who are lugging in hearts and stomachs and things and fitting them together and screwing them uh, to each other. An organism develops like a crystal in solution or a photographic plate in chemicals. It develops all over at once. And there isn't a boss in it. Because all of them act together in a strange way. It's a kind of orderly anarchy. And this is the Chinese view of the world, fundamentally. This principle of organic growth they call Tao, That's pronounced Tao. If it had an apostrophe after it, it would be pronounced Tao. But Tao is more or less the right pronunciation for that word. This Chinese word um, is uh, usually translated the course of nature or the way. The way it does it. The process of things. And that again, you see, is really very different from the Western idea of God the ruler. Of the Tao, Lao Tzu says, the great Tao flows everywhere, both to the left and to the right. 
It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. And when merits are accomplished, it lays no claim to them. And so the Chinese expression for nature becomes a word which we will translate self self or zi yang. What happens of itself? Like when you have hiccups, you don't plan to have hiccups, it just happens. When your heart beats, you don't plan it, it happens of itself. When you breathe, you can pretend that you are breathing, but most of the time you're not thinking about it and your lungs breathe of themselves. So the whole idea of nature is something happening of itself without a governor, is the organic theory of the world. So you see, we have these two others that we're going to consider in this course on Oriental philosophy, the dramatic theory and the organic theory, and therefore I feel that ways of life which use these models are so unlike Christianity, Judaism or Islam that we cannot really use the word religion of these things. Now what is there in Western culture that resembles the concerns of Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism? Because the trouble is, from the outside, they look alike. Uh, in other words, you go into a Hindu temple, or especially a Japanese Buddhist temple, and you'll be pretty convinced you're in church, in sort of a Catholic church at that, because there's incense, chants, bowings, gongs, candles, rosaries, and all the things that one associates with a theistic, monarchical religion. And yet, that isn't what's going on. There isn't the factor of obedience. Even though the image of Buddha may be sitting on a throne, covered with a canopy, and royal honors being done, there's still something different. Well, I suppose that at a long shot, probably the nearest thing to these ways of life in the West is perhaps psychotherapy in some form. Not all forms of psychotherapy. Because the objective of psychotherapy is, as you might say, to change where your head's at. Is to change your state of consciousness. If you, in other words, you are horribly depressed, if you're terrified, if you're under hallucinations, you see a head shrinker. And he tries to change your state of consciousness. And so fundamentally, these disciplines, these oriental ways, are concerned basically with changing your state of consciousness. Only here we part company. Psychotherapy is largely focused on the problems of the individual as such. The problems peculiar to this individual or that individual. These Asian ways of life are focused on certain problems peculiar to every individual. On the understanding that the average human being, and the more civilized he is, the more this is true, that the average human being is hallucinating. That he has a delusive sense of his own existence. And it is thus that the very word Buddha in Buddhism is from a root in Sanskrit, Buddha, which means to awake, to awaken. To awaken from the illusion is then to undergo a radical change of consciousness with regard to one's own existence. It is to cease being under the impression that you are just poor little me. To find out who you really are or what you really are. Behind the mask. But we saw, didn't we, 
you can never get to see what the self is basically. It's always and forever elusive. And so if I ask you, who are you really? And you say, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm John Doe. Oh, <laughs> you think so? John Doe, tell me. Um, how do you happen to have blue eyes? Well, I don't know. I, I, I didn't make my eyes. Oh, you didn't? Who else? Well, I, I have no idea how it's done. You have to have an idea how it's done to be able to do it. After all, you can open and close your hand perfectly easily. And you say, I know how to open my hand. I know how to close my hand because I can do it. But how do you? I don't know. I'm not a physiologist. Well, the physiologist says he knows how he does it, does it but he can't do it any better than you can. <laughs> so you're opening and closing your hand, aren't you? You don't know how you do it. Maybe you're bluing your eyes, too. You don't know how you do it. Because when you say, I don't know how I do it, all you are saying is, I do know how to do it, but I can't put it into words. I cannot, in other words, translate the activity called opening and closing my hand into an exact system of symbols. Into thinking. That's all. And actually, to translate the opening and closing of your hand into an exact system of symbols would take forever. Because trying to understand the world purely by thinking about it is as clumsy a process as trying to drink the Pacific Ocean out of a pint beer mug. You can only take it one mug at a time. So in thinking about things, you can only think one thought at a time, one after another in series. Thinking is a linear process like writing. One thought after another, as we say, you can only think of one thing at a time. But that's too slow for understanding anything at all. Much too slow. And our sensory input is much more than any kind of one thing at a time. And we respond with a certain aspect of our minds to the total sensory input that's coming in. Only we are not consciously aware of it. But nevertheless, you're doing it. But what kind of you is this? Certainly isn't John Doe. Isn't that little ego freak? So there's something a lot more to you than you think there is. And that's why the Hindu would say that the real you is the self, capital S. The self of the universe. Because at that level of one's existence, one is not really separate from everything else that's going on. So you see, we have something here, which I will call not philosophy, except in the most ancient sense of basic curiosity. I prefer to call these disciplines ways of liberation. Ways of liberation from Maya. And the following of them does not depend on believing in anything, in obeying anything, or on doing any specific rituals, although rituals are included for certain purposes. It is a purely experimental approach to life. It is something like a person who, say, has defective eyesight and is seeing spots and all sorts of illusions, going to an ophthalmologist to correct his vision. Buddhism is therefore basically a correction of psychic vision. To be disenthralled by the game of Maya. Not incidentally to regard the Maya as something evil, but as a good thing of which one can have too much and therefore get spiritual and psychic indigestion from which we all suffer.
Thank you.